Ragazzi, quello che state per vedere è il podcast registrato con Dave Crossland. Dave è il proprietario del Ival. Ival è un progetto, un'azienda che si occupa di fare le analisi del sangue, in particolare a bodybuilder. Quindi sono a disposizione e girano anche parecchio per le diverse palestre del paese. Io per esempio vado da Ival ogni quattro settimane per fare un panel completo di analisi e Dave ovviamente è esperto nella lettura delle stesse insieme al suo team. Una lettura che velocemente viene fatta con cognizione di causa su quello che è il ciclo e l'utilizzo degli AS che si sta facendo da parte degli atleti e questo mette l'atleta in una situazione non diciamo di sicurezza però di controllo e percezione dello status di salute la cosa interessante con Dave quindi è non soltanto il suo knowledge in generale lui partecipa a tantissimi podcast a livello internazionale ma soprattutto i dati che ha alla mano per quanto riguarda gli utilizzatori perché logicamente vedendo tutte le analisi sa quelli che sono i trend o meno un podcast che credo dovrebbe essere ascoltato da tutti gli utilizzatori non vuole far passare assolutamente il messaggio del poter fare le cose in sicurezza perché non c'è sicurezza però il minimo standard deve essere quello di un controllo maniacale è lo standard minimo questo è il messaggio che vogliamo mandare godetevi per il resto il podcast ok how are you long time uh, I'm like okay. a couple of days <laughs> yes <laughs> i'm okay mate yeah uh struggling a bit to get my Arsing gear today, but other than that, I'm good. Okay, okay, that's great. So, um, I did an introduction for you in Italian so that can people understand uh, easily, but we, we can just go uh, in English and uh, that's fine. So, well, you um, have no choice because my Italian doesn't exist. So, I, I suppose, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> so, that's uh, yeah, that's that's better. I just want to like to give uh, people an introduction about what you do with Evil, uh, especially so the experience obviously you have about all the kind, uh, like obviously the knowledge you have about PEDs and we can see on podcasts, but also the experience you have on athletes that you test and you can uh, you can see the blasts and blah, blah. So um, I just want to get uh, straight forward to the, like the question I have, like we obviously know all the steroids have uh, side effects. And mm -hmm. I'd like to know in your experience, which are the most commonly uh, side effect you can see. Like on average, when you, we see athletes, what is the most uh, common side effect and which are the most common? So the most common areas that you see changes in, I think will be the best way of putting it rather than yeah. saying problems because it's not necessarily problems. Blood thickening, so an increase in hemoglobin and red blood cell counts. Okay. Um, a lot of people mistakenly think that elevated hematocrit means thick blood. It doesn't. It it will hematocrit will elevate with dehydration. So yeah. if HCT is high but hemoglobin and red blood cells aren't, you don't have thick blood. You're dehydrated. Um, you need the increased content of hemoglobin and red blood cells to actually have thick blood. Um, cholesterol, lipids. There's a lot of argument around lipids as to how worrying or how concerning low HDL is and how concerning high LDL is. Um, historically, most of us, uh, and I presume it will be the same in Italy, have been brought up with this LDL is bad, HDL is good. Yeah. Yeah. It's not technically correct, but it is the easiest way of simplifying it for the masses. How cholesterol works is that um, HDL and LDL act more like transport proteins. So LDL will move cholesterol out of the liver into the bloodstream. HDL will move cholesterol out of the bloodstream and put it back in the liver. So it's the relationship between those two levels that's important. Um, if your HDL is too high and your LDL is too low, you actually end up with not enough cholesterol. Yeah. And cholesterol is required for hormone production in natural people, but it's also used in the production of cell wall and a whole host of enzymes that our body uses and produces. The reverse of that is if HDL is too low or LDL is too high, then you end up with excess cholesterol circulating in the bloodstream. Yeah. And the risk there is oxidization of that um, to form plaque and as a result over time and narrowing of the arteries. And this is um, a slow process. This is exposure over years. 
Now, one of the concerns around, around uh, steroid use is that steroids lower HDL. Yeah. And a couple of compounds that increase LDL. So you can have an unfavorable balance. There is argument that with exercise and what is generally a healthy diet, the risk is significantly reduced or there is no risk at all. That may well be true. We don't know. There is a lot of disagreement around the significance of cholesterol levels and subsequent heart issues or heart attacks. Um, technically, they're called myocardial infarctions, and it's where plaque will break off and create a blockage. That blockage blocks blood supply to the heart, not the blood that the heart pumps, but the blood that feeds the heart to operate, and as a result, the heart gets damaged and part of the heart dies. That's effectively yeah. what a heart attack is. So there is there is some dispute around that. My whole standpoint is if I manage it correctly and I didn't need to, I've not done myself any harm. Yeah. If I That's don't terrible. manage it and I did need to, I'm pretty fucked. So okay. I, I would rather work on the side of caution and be proven wrong in 10 years' time oh, that yeah, I think need to be most concerned about HDL than write it off as being, oh, you don't need to be really worried about it and then find out in 10 years' time, actually, yes, we did. So, yeah. And, and then the other areas are. Uh, just bit- a, a, a sec. Uh, I wanted to touch a little bit more about cholesterol. Like, uh, one thing that a lot of uh, experts and uh, or doctors said. Is like uh, there are between these arguments. Like someone said, like high LDL is more dangerous than low HDL, and vice versa. So, what are your thoughts about it? What I, I would say general, the opposite. Yeah. Okay. So, low HDL is more dangerous. We well, need to be more what I what I will say um, is low HDL. So the the marker you're looking at for the relationship between HDL and LDL and whether it's healthy or not is HDL ratio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, apart right, from, apart yeah. from the, the ratio, I mean, like, yeah. having but, the same ratio. Well, this is what I was getting to. I okay. see a bigger impact on HDL ratio with a reduced HDL Okay. than I do with an elevated LDL. Okay. Um. So from – and I think that's literally just because of the numbers involved. So – the upper, the lower limit for HDL in a male is 1.1 1. 1 1. or 1, depending on which ranges you're looking at. And the upper limit for LDL is 4. So there's already a 1 in 4 discrepancy. Yeah. So if you increase LDL by 1. Oh, yeah, I know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I got yeah, I got but yeah, yeah, you yeah, increase H- You decrease HDL by 1. Well, you've got no HDL at all. You're in a real yeah, mess. Yeah, yeah. So, so the HDL changes naturally would be balanced in okay. that a, a small HDL. But because of anabolics being so adulterant of HDL, the changes yeah. to HDL are much more significant. Yeah. So where you wouldn't naturally see huge drops in HDL without a really bad diet, um, in anabolics, you can have a decent diet, throw some Primo in, and your HDL is going to be 0.5. Yeah. That 0.5 drop is going to have a much more significant impact on your HDL ratio than a 0.5 increasing LDL. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So, so there's the, there's a, there's a ratio of one to four there. Um, so technically, LDL could elevate four times as much as HDL can lower, and and then you'd have a balanced effect between the two. Okay. So uh, just in case, like we need to uh, uh, do something about cholesterol. Obviously, we are talking about bodybuilders, so stop taking steroids is obviously the best option. But sometimes we can't. Uh, <laughs> but I know there are lots, lots of OTC we can use, like krill oil, um, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, other OTC in, in general to to raise up the HDL. But I think one thing that can help a lot from my knowledge is the use of antioxidants. Because obviously, when you have this imbalance, the problem is that uh, all the cholesterol you are going to storage is prone to be oxidized. So mm-hmm. using a lot of antioxidant is kind of a help. Or maybe it makes the cholesterol problem less of a problem. What, what it's less impacting. Yeah, I yeah, mean, vitamin, okay. vitamin C... 
which is a great antioxidant, is also shown to be very impressive in, in HDL management. Uh, in yeah. fact, poly, polyene therapy requires the dosing of one gram of liposomal vitamin C and five grams of lysine twice a day. And that is probably one of the most effective therapies for increasing HDL. Okay. Um, a lot of a lot of people, for a start point, would look at citrus bergamot um, yeah. or krill oil. Um, and just so people realize, fish oil, generally fish oil is going to be rancid. It doesn't store very well. It doesn't keep very well. If your fish oil smells of fish, then it's off, technically. Yeah. yeah uh, so krill oil is much more stable. And the other thing, advantage of krill oil is that it's absorbed much more effectively because it's a phospholipid. Yeah. Um, whereas fish oil is a triglyceride, so it's not absorbed as well. You can, which you may or may not be aware of this one, go one above that. Uh, and that is a, a product that's starting to gain popularity in Norway and Sweden and those areas is Kalanis oil. Okay, what was that? And that's the precursor to krill. Okay, okay. Um, so Kal Kalanis oil has now been licensed for harvest. Okay. Um, and it's not a it's not something that's hidden the market hard at the moment outside of its sort of native countries, but. From what I've seen of it uh, and, and actually personally used of it, it is quite impressive. It also has the added bonus of improving HbA1c as well. Oh, that's brilliant. That's yeah, brilliant. so uh, I would definitely have a sniff one. around Kalanis oil. Um, Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I personally think it could be a quite a big health supplement in the coming years, but we'll see. Okay. I've, yeah. I've, been, I've been wrong very often, so uh, okay. I could well, well be wrong again. <laughs> That's honest for me to say. That's honest for you to say. Okay, so um, that's for cholesterol, and obviously the cycle design. So the the choose of the single gear as an yeah. There's there's there's, there's certain steroids are going to be much more impacted on cholesterol than other steroids. Uh, Primo by far is the most impacting on cholesterol. Okay. Um, Primo is regarded as a very inoculant drug. It, it, it's mild. It's gentle. It doesn't have any side effect, and it physically not so much you know you don't see high blood pressure you don't see issues with prostates and stuff like that but what you do see is an absolute obliteration of hdl okay masteron is second in that list um okay. and then it sort of calms down a little bit deck is fairly mild test is fairly mild though there is some impact trends a little bit harsher eq is fairly mild anavar is slightly strange in that not only is it a DHT and all orals are slightly harsher on on HDL, uh, HDL than than injectables yeah. will be, but Anavar has the added negative of it increases LDL as well. Okay, that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> um, I mean, other direct effects, obviously hormone management. So you've yeah. got things like prolactin elevation, estrogen elevation, that sort of thing, and the last one is prostate. Um, okay. It's not a huge problem. We don't see massive numbers of, of elevated PSA, uh, and PSA is not the most robust of markers. It will elevate with other things. Um, now, recently, I'm not sure what it's like in other countries, but in the UK, they changed the threshold. So PCA okay. used to be four. Anything below four was acceptable. But as prostate cancer is the most common cancer, uh, there is. They've gone very strict with it now, and the marker is one point. I be one point two actually. Okay. But it does change oh, right. a little bit with age. I okay. would still generally work on the four. If if but if you see PSA levels are increasing, yeah. from test to test, then definitely it's time to start having a discussion with your doctor about having a look at your prostate. Yeah. Uh, anabolics will enlarge the prostate, and that's what you're going to end up with in an enlarged prostate. You, you know, using steroids is not going to cause cancer in the prostate. It would aggr aggravate if cancer traits were there, yeah. but it wouldn't initially cause them. Uh, but it can cause an enlarged prostate, which can create issues further down the line. This becomes more of a concern in older users who generally have an element of an enlarged prostate anyway okay. so you'll find slightly higher levels in older people okay um but they're the sort of main areas you know blood thickness cholesterol 
you have other physical impacts like blood pressure, yeah, um, water retention, but usually they're going to be linked to either the thickening of blood or they're going to be linked to okay. the hormone imbalances that you have created with your usage. Yeah, really. And when it comes to uh, hematocrit and uh, hemoglobin, how do you manage that? Because uh, lots of people uh, do the bloodlets, but they have a rebound effect most of so, the time. So the thing with the bloodlet, where people fail very often with the bloodlet, is that they'll bloodlet, but they won't hydrate heavily enough. Okay. You've removed... A, so for those that don't know, a bloodlet is a removal of a pint of blood. Uh, same as blood donation. The idea is you remove a pint of blood, the blood plasma is released within uh, replenished within 24 hours, and at that point you effectively dilute the remaining blood. Exactly. Um, so it becomes thinner. What a lot of people fail to do is they fail to hydrate adequately post-bloodlet. Okay. That will have a significant impact on how successful the bloodlet is. That post-24 hours is quite important and quite crucial. Okay. Uh, there's a few people that have suggested you do an IV, just a hydration uh, okay. post-bloodlet. It's not necessary. It is an added expense, and it isn't really necessary as long as you get a decent amount of fluids and electrolytes into your system within the following 24 hours, you'll have much less of a rebound issue. Okay. Uh, the thing with blood thickening is it's a little bit self-perpetuated. So as hem we artificially increase hemoglobin levels through using anabolics. Anabolics increase the production of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries oxygen and nutrition in the blood. So to a point, an elevation is actually beneficial. It will improve performance and nutritional transit. When we start getting hemoglobin that's going over 175, 180, yeah. Then the impact starts to become negative. When we start going over 190, we start to see a significant increase in health risk. And when we get to 200 or above, then there's a significant increase in clots. Yeah. Uh, and, and stroke is of particular concern. And quite simply, what you'll also find is that your cognitive function is reduced and you feel very sluggish. And part of the reason of that, the blood is actually at this point that thick, it won't flow down the finer capillaries. Yeah. So you are actually creating elements of restricted blood flow within the brain, which is why your cognitive function starts to decrease. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, when you get to where blood is thick, the heart has to work much harder, pushing that blood around at rest, mm -hmm. and it struggles effectively then what you're getting is actually oxygen starvation because okay. even though you've got this high concentration of hemoglobin it's not moving okay yeah, around yeah. the body so that in itself self-petuates more blood thickening as your body tries to create more hemoglobin okay, yeah, yeah. to increase yeah. your oxygenation and then what you'll find is when you exercise and your heart rate is elevated you get the benefit of that extra hemoglobin and you feel yeah. invigorated right. and charged and a very common way of people will say is, you know, you go to the gym, you feel sluggish, you can't be bothered. Once you've done four or five sets, you feel great, you're brand new and you want to go. And that's because now the blood is pumping faster. And so you're actually okay. able to you take advantage of that extra oxygen. Yeah. Outside of the bloodletting realms, we are looking at, believe it or not, um, one of the biggest solutions to a lot of the problems we face, and it's the one nobody likes doing, is cardio. Yeah. But hard cardio, hit cardio, yeah. you know, conditioning okay. work will yeah. actually help lower hemoglobin. Okay. In fact, uh, endurance athletes generally suffer with low hemoglobin. Yeah. Because exactly. they use up that material in the exercise that yeah. they're doing. So that the plasmatic volume tend to increase in that yeah. case. So um, exercise or cardio is, is definitely going to be useful. Natokinase. And yeah. um, that, that one. <laughs> yep, and IP six. Gotcha. Oh yeah, Incitor. So Nicodase is I'll get this right. I believe it's ten milligrams per kilo yeah. dosing, and I think Nicodase is a couple of grams. Not um, IP six is a couple of grams. Yeah, something like that. Uh, roughly would be the dosing you'd be looking at um, to lower hemo through a, a supplementation. 
it works. It does seem to be a little bit person dependent. Yeah. And you've also got to remember that if you are on a cycle, you are constantly having a background driver. So you've constantly yeah. got something there pushing this up. Yeah. So you may not see massive reductions, but what you are seeing and not probably not realizing is you're actually stopping further elevations. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. There are a couple of other drivers that people don't always consider as well. Now, one of the things that's very common around bodybuilders, particularly off season, is sleep apnea. Yeah. And sleep apnea is a reduction of oxygenation. A reduction of oxygenation causes yeah. high hemo. Yeah. Um, so snoring, sleep apnea, smoking, vaping will all increase also blood vaping. thicknesses. Yeah. Anything that restricts yeah. oxygen. Okay. Okay. So anything that restricts the lungs' abilities to absorb oxygen, which where you're vaping, when those lungs are filled with smoke, you're not yeah. getting full oxygenation. That, that's interesting because in Italy, I think is more of a trend now. Everybody's waving like the last time I went to competition, all the bodybuilders are waving. Uh, obviously, because of the you know the anger during the contest prep, they used to yeah. vape a lot. Yeah, it's it's a distraction. It's something yeah, to, yeah, exactly, to help them exactly. cope with uh, the rigors of diet, and I get that. Yeah. I would I would suspect that when someone's in the situation of comp prep, the risk of blood thickening is going to be quite reduced because yeah. of the level of cardio, because of the reduction of calories. That's what I see. Yeah. Um, Maybe also uh, what I've seen is uh, I tend to have like the hematocrit and more hematocrit than hemoglobin, but I tend to be a little bit higher usually. And uh, a, a big game changer I've noticed was simply to add more salt and a lot of more water in my day. So well, to, that's, to try, that's like, yeah. <clears throat> not just water, but also salt. That I, I tend to you like because uh, uh, what I, I found, like I said, okay, look. Uh, so with water and salt, I have an increase of uh, plasma volume. So let, let, let's try to increase the salt and obviously balance with water. And yeah. I've seen the hematocrit and the emo in general uh, went down. Yeah. So hematocrit. Um, HCT is a measurement of the number of red cells in a given volume of blood. Yeah. And this is why it's very sensitive to hydration, because if hydration is low or you're dehydrated, then the, the fluid volume in your blood is low. And so the concentration of blood, tra uh, blood cells in an increased volume increases. You don't necessarily see HCT elevate with a high red blood cell count. Okay. Um, now, when red blood cells are high, they are smaller. Okay. So even though you may have more red blood cells, you have smaller cells. Okay, gotcha. And as a result, the volume doesn't actually change that much. It's just yeah. how that volume's divided. Yeah. When you elevate hemoglobin, the red cell size increases because it's containing that, that more hemo. That then increases the volume, which drives HCC up. So yeah, if you're if you're improving hydration through fluid and, and salt intake, you're going to see HCT drop definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, dehydration will have an impact on hemo, but it's not as strong as its impact is on HCT. Yeah, obviously, obviously, yeah. Because you still got that material within the cell existing. Yeah. Um, but the concentration per volume would go up slightly if you were dehydrated of hemo. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the biggest driving factor around the blood thickening is is more the hemoglobin than anything else, but red yeah. cell cells do play into it. Um, and then a lot of you'll get a lot of other things like mean cell volume, mean cell hemoglobin, red cell yeah. distribution that will change. And they're really all comparatives of where your hemo and red cells are. So if your red cells are relatively low comparative to your hemoglobin, then your mean cell volume will increase because you've got more hemoglobin per cell, so the volume of the cell is enlarged, so the average cell yeah. volume is greater. Red cell distribution is the measurement of the range of red cell sizes. So that will go up if you've got more smaller cells or if you've got more larger cells. If the cells are of a similar size, then red cell distribution will come down. Yeah, Mean cell hemo is quite self-explanatory. It's the yeah. average amount of hemoglobin per cell. Uh, a meso hemoconcentration is a very similar thing. Um, 
So uh, those two do change, but they're more based on the relationship of hemo to, to red cell rather than the actual total values themselves. So and you'll often see high hemo, high red cells, and high HCT, and everything else will be normal because yeah. the relationships are still where they need to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. So um, you, you mentioned about RBC in general and cholesterol. You didn't mention anything about liver enzymes and liver problems. You didn't notice that much. Right. So. And I, I'll explain you why. I'm asking you because lots of, uh, I mean, athletes that ask for my help or came to me from Italy, they have like the liver enzymes fucking destroyed. Like okay, 7, that's... 800 liver enzymes, something like that. That That's that's interesting because it's not something I see with the UK populace. And that my 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 thing is that uh, so just to to give you an example, I in Italy we don't have knowledge about steroids because, mm. uh, so uh, steroids use is really illegal, like really really illegal. At the point that uh, I think most of the athletes out in the moment, uh, people don't know, but they had to have police coming in the house at one point of their career in the morning, five a.m. And uh, most of the coaches in Italy have like. Uh, uh, procedure in uh, fucking judges and uh, stuff like that, uh, investigations around. Uh, it's it's a little bit confusing. So nobody talks really about steroids. So the knowledge okay. is really low. And what okay. happened is obviously, uh, let's say I I want to start a cycle and go to the coach. I have no knowledge. If the coach said, okay, let's start with 10 grams, let's start with one gram, let's start you with would, whatever. You'd just, just do it look, because you know just the numbers. Yeah. It's yeah. like to me, like uh, I go to buy a car and people say, okay, that's that's the fucking number of the engine you just, or yeah you just uh, that that's what it, it is then you yeah, just yeah, yeah, it is. It. okay yeah. okay trust you so what i see is that in italy there is this conception that when you jump into the prep uh, everything you need to start you need to start it's like mandatory to have a contest prep is drop the test uh insert use uh, ai use caber and use uh, fucking tons of orals like i've seen people two grams Two grams no. 0.5 yeah. total orals like 100 win 100 anamar 100 halo and all this stuff Jesus. that's what that's what's happening yeah, yeah. so what so, i see the most con yeah, yeah the, the most common problem in italian athletes is the liver enzymes the liver in general and uh, they use orals obviously also no season so right so injectables generally don't have a huge impact on liver yeah with the exception of eq EQ will increase liver yeah. weight, but it, yeah. again, it doesn't have a huge impact on liver. It should be also with DHT, uh, DHB, sorry. Yeah, well, I was just AB. about to say, to a bit, and trend can also have some impacts on the okay. liver. Okay. Um, we will see elevated ALT levels, but ALT, when you look at liver enzymes, ALT is, the easiest way to describe ALT is it's like a rev counter on an engine. Okay, yeah. So it's more descriptive of how hard the liver is currently working. Okay. Anything up to about 100 old would be achieved with a hard training session. Yeah. <clears throat> um, medications can easily put old 1, 150. Uh, a heavy course of antibiotics could put old around 150, depending on the type of antibiotic. And painkillers are also particularly stressful on the liver. Now, strangely... Worldwide, the number of cases of liver cancer directly linked to anabolic use is single digits. So we're only looking at sort of five, six a year of people that actually contract liver cancer from the use of anabolics. All of them are in Italy. I, well, I know of one in the UK. Okay, okay. However, he used 200 milligrams of oral anabolics consistently for years okay yeah kind of uh, and so yeah it it's and it is the orals that are the most stressful and the reason yeah. for that being and I, I know you know this but just in case anyone are watching who doesn't is oral steroids are what's known as 17 alkylated yeah. when a steroid passes through the liver it can get broken down by the liver um because orals are digested they they go through the liver initially before they actually sort of get into the body and hit the bloodstream as a result of that, if they weren't 17 alkylated, they'd be broken down by the liver and they wouldn't actually have an impact. Yeah. So they are 17 alkylated. That 
means the liver gets stressed because it's trying to metabolize them and can't do it. Yeah. That raises liver enzymes. Now, the general guideline around all is if it's 100 or below, you can ignore it. It's not concerning. If it's 200 or below, you want to know what it is. Yeah. And you want to be, okay, this is the cause. That's fine. Move on. Two to 300, you want to know what it is and you want to be stopping fairly soon. So you want exposure to that level for just minimum a couple of weeks, you know, sorry, maximum a few weeks. If it's over, if it's three to 400, you're stopping and anything above yeah. 400, stop doctors. Um, so generally, like you say, if there's this big trend towards oral use, particularly pre-comp, and pre-comp is stressful on the body just from the diet, just from the way you are conducting yourself, both physically and diet-based, let alone any chemicals you're putting in that mix. Yeah. To add orals on top of that is going to significantly have an impact on the liver, yes. Uh, but actually, injectables are generally regarded as being non-hepatoxic. They're regarded as being liver-friendly. Um, so it is the oral medication that has the biggest impact. Um, you see elevations in GGT through certain medications. That usually means that bile ducts are blocked, but you will also see GTT elevate with alcohol. So okay, yeah, yeah. if you've been on the piss a couple of days before, you get your bloods done and your GTT's high and your alt's high, that's the booze that's causing that. Don't suddenly yeah. panic. Your liver's dying. It's not. That's the initial impacts of drinking as your body processes it. Okay. Now, your body processes one one unit of alcohol an hour. Okay. So if you went out and had 20 pints, you've got 40 hours of work before your body's got rid of that alcohol. So that's okay. obviously going to have an impact on that liver for a couple of days. Yeah. Uh, so just worth bearing in mind the process rate that there is there. And it doesn't get faster. or It'll only get slower. It never gets faster. Okay. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, yeah. Um, Oral use will have a significant impact on the liver. Now, strangely, orals have, a, particularly UK-based, obviously not so much Italy-based, but particularly UK-based, and, and the States as well, orals have this reputation of being liver destroyers. Yeah. And as a result of that, they are generally regarded with a lot of respect. Yeah. Probably more respect than they actually require. Um, yeah, a little bit much. Oxymethylone is regarded as being this really harsh liver toxic compound, and it, and it's not. Yeah. I mean, it's prescribed to children at one milligram per kilo. Okay. So it isn't That's anywhere near as harsh, but it does keep people safe. Yeah. Because there's this cultural yeah, development of respect in orals, absolutely. so they generally don't get abused that much. Yeah. But obviously, if there isn't that knowledge base, it's like anything. If you don't know, yeah. You just do. Um, and, I mean, we've all done daft stuff because someone told us to. We knew no better. Yeah, yeah um, that's, that's, yeah, I mean, I, I, did, think... I did stupid stuff even though I knew better, but that's a different story. <laughs> that's another, another question. Another story. So, because uh, my, uh, like, this is not something, like, uh, I'd like to talk about. But basically, what I think is that you can just, with steroids, it, it all comes to spending health. So mm -hmm. you go there and you have health to spend. And my uh, thought process is always look at the blood and say, okay, where can I spend health? And let's mm -hmm. say I have a low HDL or some probably with RBC or something. I may have some liver health to spend. I may want to use um, some orals, stuff like that, because I can spend health, like liver health, in um, and not spend something else. So it's all about, I always think like, at the end, it's like you are in a ship and the captain is the one that decides where to go. And in the steroids and athlete's ship, the captain is uh, the fucking health. So, you know what? The, I mean? the problem with the anabolic steroid use is it's very trend-driven. Um, yeah, yeah. That's... Uh, and unfortunately, that's... you get influences from key people that it's not a one-size-fits-all. And it is yeah. important that you, like you say, you look at your health and you see where your risk factors are. Steroids aren't magic and they are not mysteries. Steroids have effects. 
some of these facts are unwanted or undesired for the purposes of bodybuilding. Some of these effects are desirable. Yeah. So side effects is technically an incorrect term because a side effect yeah, is uh, side effects. Like yeah, it's, so they're, just, is they're, all side of, they're all they're all effects yeah. of the steroid use. Yeah. Uh, testosterone conversion to estrogen is an effect. It's not actually a side effect. It's not something that shouldn't happen but does. It's yeah. something that's supposed to happen. Yeah, we're talking about off-label use. So yeah. But the, <laughs> the, the, the point is that with research and knowledge and learning, you can find out what the, these drugs all do, Yeah, uh, what their effects are, how they impact, and you can then use that knowledge to see if that drug applies to your personal circumstances yeah. with your body fat level, your ability to perform in the sense of, do you know you can stick to a very clean diet or do you know you're not going to be able to do that? Do you know you can do cardio on a regular basis or do you know you're not going to do that? And these are all factors you need to consider where your current body fat level is. You're not going to encourage someone who's carrying 50 pounds of fat to use heavily aromatizing drugs exactly. because they're going to have massive estrogen problems because the body fat is going to increase the aromatization even more. Exactly. So that's going to be problematic to deal with. So you're going to tend to go down DHTs because they're going to be much easier for that individual to manage. So it is a case of, and it, it, it it's something that Broderick's coined, and I, I steal it off him all the time, but I have to give him credit for it. They are tools, and you need to pick the right tool for the right job. Yeah. Now, I can hammer a nail in with a heavy spanner. Yeah. It's not the most effective of doing it, and I might make a bit of a mess while doing it, but it will get the job done. Yeah. But I'm going to get a much cleaner and neater and efficient import of that nail if I use a hammer. Absolutely. And that's exactly the same with drugs. I can use a certain drug to get a certain effect. Yeah. But it might not be the cleanest, the neatest, and the most efficient way of doing it. So for argument's sake, off season, I want to do an all out bulk. I really want to put a load of mass on. I'm not going to look at Primo. Nice drug though it is, it doesn't lend itself for big mass gains. I'm going to look at Test. I'm going to look at Deca. I'm going to look at very old school wet drugs. If I'm dieting for a show, I'm probably not going to consider running Deca and Dima. Yeah. I could still diet on them, and I know people yeah, that yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But estrogen management becomes a problem, and it's very difficult to do, and all the aspects yeah. that come with that. And so it, it's a case of, you know, you look at your unique circumstances, and that is your ability to do what you need to do, yeah. your personal health, your personal current situation as in body composition, yeah. and what you're aiming to achieve. Absolutely. And then you match that against the drugs and their effects, what they need to be done to manage them and and the cost. And and like you said, there is a health cost. There's a cost to everything we do. Nothing is free. And this is very true with drugs. Now, if you look at a steroid and it seems to be really effective and real promising for drug use, for growth, there's a cost. If you don't know what it is, go find it. Yeah. Because if that drug will have a cost. There'll be a price to pay for the effectiveness of that drug. Yeah. Uh, and the best example of this is Tren. It's a very powerful anabolic. It's probably the most powerful anabolic, and particularly when you start getting into methylated versions of it. Yeah. Um, but its impacts are so wide-reaching, and a lot we still don't understand. Yeah. It's the only steroid that has a direct impact on the kidneys. It directly affects the kidneys. We know it affects brain chemistry in a dramatic way. We know it affects cannabinoid receptors. We know it affects GABA receptors. We know it affects dopamine receptors. We know it has a, an impact on, on neuron activity, which is why it causes so much paranoia and anxiety because it stops GABA from working and increases neuron. So you overthink and you cannot yeah. calm down. Um, so, you know, it has an impact hormonally as well 
it actually increases prolactin through a reduction of dopamine, but it also increases estrogen receptor sensitivity. Yeah. So even if estrogen levels are controlled, you're more sensitive to that estrogen yeah, than you that, would previously yeah. be. Um, so it's such a wide reaching drug. So there's a cost for that being so good at what it does yeah, yeah, is yeah. all that management that's issues that you need yeah. to look into. Um, and, and that's across the board with all of them. So there is yeah. no free school meals with this. You know, everything has an impact. And if you don't know what it is, be assured there is one and you need to start looking to find out what it is. Yeah. And what about kidney problems? Have you seen more, a lot of them? Or? I would have said that beyond those direct cycle directly driven impacts like yeah. cholesterol and blood thickening, the more long-term impacts that we see, it, it would next on the list would probably be kidneys, yes. Um, and this comes from a series of factors. As we've already stated, trend has a direct impact on the kidneys. It's been associated with what's known as AKI, which is acute kidney injury. Now, you can recover from acute kidney injuries, but you have too many of them and you end up with damage. Yeah. You and don't you recover. Re you don't recover from kidney damage. Yeah. The liver is regenerative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The kidneys are not. The kidneys are actually quite fragile. Yeah. Uh, once they are damaged, that's it. They will stay damaged. And 95% of the time, they will actually worsen. Okay. The most common damage to a kidney is what's known as an nephrotic syndrome yeah. or FSGS. Now, in the kidneys are glomeri. They act like little filters. Uh, and basically what happens is the fluid passes through and things like proteins, which are big molecules, stay in the blood flow and the other stuff goes out. So it filters through. When you have damaged kidneys, these glomeri have holes in them and they allow protein to pass through which is why when you urinate with kidney damage, you get foamy urine because that's high protein, protein in your urine. And protein urea is a way of checking kidney function, how much protein there is in your urine. However, have you ever had a hole in your trousers yeah. that starts okay. small yeah. and then you carry change, either. you carry loose yeah. change, and that hole gets larger because of the loose change? Yeah, That's what happens in your kidney. So once the holes have formed... Protein yeah, molecules worse worse. keep pushing through and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and therefore kidney function becomes more and more reduced. One of the reasons they look at low protein diets on kidney problems is to try and minimize circulating protein yeah. to therefore minimize this wear and tear effect that you're going to have on already damaged yeah. kidneys. Um, kidneys will also be damaged through high blood pressure. They will also be damaged through um, thick blood. And then obviously, like I say, you've got the direct impact of trend as well. Um, so it's more of a, a like, uh, what I want to like say to people is a more like a chronic situation. Like the problem, I think, from my understanding is that when you use steroids, the problem is that you have all these little effects, like a slightly uh, uh, high blood pressure, slightly high HT, ACT, uh, slightly low HDL, blah, blah, blah. And in years, in years, in years, mm. it's going to be to create like, some damage, like chronic yeah, damages. I, I like it like Chinese water torture. Yeah. You know, a drop on your forehead is not going to bother you. Sit there for three days and, and yeah, it's going to start it's driving you. Know. And it's the same thing. These are small negative impacts that develop large problems over time. Over time. What you'll see with kidneys is you'll the problem as well is that the main markers we use for testing kidney function is creatinine. Yeah. Creatinine elevates with high protein, massively yeah. elevates from exercise, yeah. dehydration, and to a smaller extent, creatine use. Yeah. So you have all these things that adulterate that marker that cause it to elevate. The result is there is knowledge of this within the industry. So a lot of people discount elevated creatinine yeah, because they're like, oh, it's because I train, it's because of that. Yeah. Now, we work on the creatinine threshold being 120 for a male. Yeah, Anything above that, and we suggest that you go and retest, making sure you're well hydrated and you are at least three, four days rested. Yeah. 
or you do a cystatin C test, which isn't yeah. affected by those markers. Unfortunately, a cystatin C test is expensive, but yeah. it's not as expensive as living with knackered kidneys for the rest of your oh, life. Fuck yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it is important, um, but nine times out of 10, four days rest, decent hydration, you'll see a much improved result. Now, we generally work on anything above 60 EGFR as being acceptable. Yeah. But the reality is anything below 90 EGFR is medically classed as stage one kidney failure. Yeah. But that's the so that's every that's every pretty much every bodybuilder I've ever seen yeah, is, yeah, yeah, is below that. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. But because it yeah. is connected to creatine, is it like a calculus on based on yes, it, it's a calculus based using creatinine, age, yeah. and a series of other numbers. The other thing for anyone who's Afro Caribbean, you need to times your creatinine reads well, your EGFR reading by 1.2. Afro-Caribbean descent have naturally higher levels of creatinine. It's okay. not accommodated for in the ranges. So whatever your EGFR is, you times it by 1.2, and that's your adjusted reading. Uh, but, yeah, kidneys, and that's the problem with kidneys. So, I mean, you'll see a lot of, of guys that are just hovering around that 60 threshold mark. And it's just a case of if it's stable, we're not concerned. Yeah. If you're seeing a progressive decline, yeah, then we are. Yeah. Even if you're still above 60, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you've but gone you've 80, decline. 75, 72, 68, yeah. 65, that's a decline. That yeah. is something I would want to be looking at because it is progressive. Catch yeah. it early enough, and you can do a lot to stay it off. A glutathione is very, very good for supporting kidneys because it lowers that overall information. Yeah. Uh, BPC-157 as IV is very good for kidneys. There's been some really interesting studies on BP yeah. BPC-157 for kidney support. Um, it's also been shown to reverse arthritis as well, as BP-157. Reverse, sorry? Reverse arthritis. Oh, that's brilliant. Hmm? Waiting for it. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. no, It's fun as arthritis. You don't want it. Yeah. It's going to Bloody be interesting, hurt. this molecule you like. <laughs> so uh, I always suggest, that just to do a recap to people, I always suggest like to do bloods every <laughs> four to six weeks every time, just because uh, we've seen that the most important thing is not just the value itself, because the value is uh, just a screenshot, but looking at the evolution of the single Patterns, values. yeah. Progression, patterns, yeah, yeah very much so. So, and I think that's something a lot of people forget is that the blood test that you have is literally that. It's a snapshot at that time. Yeah, exactly. So it can change over time and you need mm -hmm. to see the evolution. But from my understanding, like the, the most simple, the most like immediately uh, advice we can d give to athletes that they don't uh, maybe care that much is to drink more. So be more hydrated. And doing the cardio, I think these two things are like is going to do like proper cardio, as you yeah. said. Like, no, I'm not yeah. saying every day, but like doing proper cardio, dress to race is not not just the walking on a fucking treadmill. It's not cardio. Yeah, that the, yeah, that's you speak to sir. I do cardio. What do you do? I do 45 minutes on a treadmill. I, I watch podcasts. No, you're going for a walk, mate. You, yeah, exactly. it's got to be high intensity stuff. You need to be pushing your cardiovascular capability. Exactly. And I would say a baseline would be 20, 25 minutes, three times a week. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that, that, that's a good bet. If you can do more, great. A lot of people, and I was guilty of this, are scared because they, they literally think it's going to reduce their ability to grow. Nah, not. Uh, well, is is the truth of it. You will be fitter. Yeah. Which means you will be able to train more intensely. That you will recover so faster and you'll improve your appetite and your metabolism, which means you'll actually be able to consume more calories way over what you actually burn in the cardio that you do. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I always suggest. Like to me, mm. cardio is something mm. like religion. You have to have it during the off season every time. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I think these are, uh, and then check the bloods and just try to do something whenever you see so it's not just a okay cholesterol is like that but you know i use steroids okay liver enzymes are like but you know i use steroids yeah but either you stop or you do something about it 
there is there is there is a common problem within usage where adulterated results are justified because they use anabolics and it's like yeah. they are still adulterated health markers yes they may be there because you use anabolics but that doesn't mean they should be ignored it still means you should work towards manage them the best exactly. you can and and like off cycle periods use that to build your hdl as high as you can exactly. because That's inevitably exactly. when you go on cycle it's coming down yeah so rather and a lot of people do this they'll say oh my, my hdl is a bit low i've got it up to 1.1 it's back in range brand new no mate let's push that up to 1.6 1.7 1.8 wherever we can go with it yeah. so that next time you go on by the time it's lowered you're only lowering to 0.9 or 1 because you've built exactly. this buffer so yeah. this there's, there's things like that about preempting what you know is going to happen so you've got more longevity in what you're doing uh but yeah i mean frequency of bloods there's always going to be a cost prohibition there yeah. And whether you like it or not, for the mass majority of people, they are going to favor buying their drugs and buying their protein over paying for their blood work. Yeah. But I would say definitely I would look at a, a hormone or at least an estrogen and prolactin check around week four, five, six. Yeah. So you can effectively manage it correctly. Uh, and then, yes, I would look at depending on what you're doing a pre and a post check sometimes potentially a during check if it's a particularly heavy setup that you're running you know if you're if you're doing if you're an experienced bodybuilder who's been going a few years and you're just doing a a short 500 milligram a test cycle we're not going to be too interested in checking blood markers in the middle of that but if you're pushing grams because of what you're trying to achieve, then yes, you you are going to have to be much more health conscious in the way you check out what's going on. Absolutely. Because things can change rapidly. Yeah, that's another thing. Okay, so uh, I thank you for these uh, spots uh, and these talk together. No problem. Pleasure. I'd like to have you back for other topics like off-season cycle design and stuff like that. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to do this first one talking about uh, side effect because I think is the first thing we we do, we need to check and touch for Italian uh, guys. Just no problem at all, mate. Anytime, just give me a message and we'll sort okay. something out. So yeah, we'll uh, we'll see us in front of Ultraflex uh, as usual. Yeah, I will Thank see you. you uh, yeah, the end of March. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like all every, right, my friend. Month. Okay, so thank you, Dave, again, and uh, see you in the next time. Take care now. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye.